All right, Halloween season is upon us again. Hope everyone's busy out there crafting and building and upgrading their displays or their haunts. I wanted to share with you guys what I've been up to for the last couple of months. These five gentlemen here are going to make up my pumpkin army that I'm adding to my display. They don't have any legs because they're going to be coming through a, uh, a line of corn stalks and they're going to be slid over a piece of rebar. That way it looks like they'll be creeping out from the corn stalks. And also then I didn't have to build legs. So anyway, I have one more build and I thought now that I got my technique kind of all figured out, I would do the sixth one as a tutorial to share with you. Um, none of the steps are very complicated but there are a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this pretty um, to the point, not ramble on, try to keep it under 10 minutes. We'll see how I do. Um, the one that I'm building is not for my display, but a gift for a farm stand that's been really good to us. Um, so it's not going to be as creepy as what these are, because I don't want to go scaring the little kids with, that are there getting pumpkins with their parents. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of a friendlier pumpkin, but all the techniques are going to be exactly the same. And I'll show you some close-ups at the end of the video on all of my guys here. So let's get to it. All right. Well, here's what I got so far. This is the basic frame that I'm going to be going with. Um, I have him all put together like this right now because I wanted to show you the direction I'm moving with this guy. Um, I decided since he was going to a farm stand and I don't know how they're going to use him. Um, unlike my props, I figured I would give this guy legs just so that way he'll be a little bit more versatile for wherever they want to display him. Uh, also decided to go with full PVC arms. Most of my guys just have this uh, the ceiling wire for their arms, which makes them a little bit more bendable, pliable. Um, it's a little bit easier for shaping. Uh, but where there's going to be kids and people around, maybe taking pictures. I don't know if the arms are going to get pulled or tugged or anything like that. So I figured going with the PVC was a little bit uh, of a safer move. That way the arms don't get bent out of place or anything like that. Um, anyway, so this is where you want to get to before you start tinfoiling. Um, I'm going to stop the video, strip him down. I'll take you step by step through what I've done so far. All right. Now let's get into how to put them together. The very first thing you want to do before you start anything is find a spot where you can work comfortably on this guy. There's a good handful of steps and a fair amount of drying time. So you want to have a place that you can work comfortably and you can also move him or he won't be in the way. Um, the first four that I did, I had uh, drilled holes in my workshop table and put pieces of rebar coming out of that that I was able to slide the bodies over and work on. And that was okay, except for working on the back side of them was a pain in the butt, or any time I had to do something in the workshop that wasn't affiliated with them, they were in the way and I had nowhere to move them to. On the very last one I did, I realized that this light stand that I have works as a perfect stand for these guys and you can just slide them right over you can spin them, you can pick the stand up and move it. Of course, you figure that out on the very last one you do after you fought the first four. So get a spot that you can work comfortably. After that, you're going to want to choose a length for your spine. Cut your spine to whatever length you want. Um, I topped this one off with a cross because like I said, I'm doing the PVC arms. If you're not doing PVC arms, uh, if you're just doing wire arms, you don't have to have a cross here. Uh, it'll save you a couple of bucks. You can just run another loop around up here and then have the wires coming off of that. Um, and you want to figure out kind of what your body position for your pumpkin is going to be. Is he going to be up like he's chasing you? Is he going to be sneaking? I decided with this guy, he was going to be holding the pumpkin that had the farm stand name carved in it. Other hand on the hip, kind of like a farmer's stance. Um, so if you have that in mind as you're cutting the pieces, it will kind of give you a rough idea of like the lengths to cut them. Um, then from there, continue building up that spine and start getting yourself your neck or the vine that goes to your head. 
You can do this with fittings or you can do it with a heat gun and warm it up and just kind of bend it into the shapes that you want. Um, I kind of do a combination of both. Uh, then coming up to where the pumpkin actually attaches, I found this to be a pretty slick way of getting the pumpkin head to stay up there. It is a three quarter slip fitting up top to a three quarter inch female thread inside here. And then this fitting is three quarter male thread and it flares out to a one inch slip fitting. So if you take your pumpkin that you've carved and you drill a three quarter inch hole in the top of his head, you can slide those threads right through just like so. And then to attach his head, you can just thread it right on. And I like to have the head on there as I'm building the rest of the body, just so I can kind of get the feeling of what it's gonna look like. You can kind of tweak the angles. Do you want his head cocked a little bit? Do you want his head leaning more forward? Is he gonna be looking down on you? Like, you can kind of get a much better feel for it that way. So I'll build his spine up, get his top stem to his head, and get the head attached on there. Once that's attached, I'll come back and I'll start working on the rib cage. And the rib cage here is just galvanized ceiling wire. They sell it at Home Depot, any store, any like uh, home improvement store will have it. It's for hanging drop ceilings, like the drop panel ceilings. Uh, it's 18 gauge galvanized. You pick up like a 10 pack of these for like four bucks. They're like eight feet long. They bend super easy. Almost, you know, feel like a, like a coat hanger, that same thickness. So it's pretty easy to work with. Um, a little bit of a pain in the butt to cut. So I just have a small pair of bolt cutters. Um, that works out really well. You could use a grinder, you could use a hacksaw, a little bit more um, involved time-wise there. This makes things really easy. Plus, as you're bending, if you have a little piece you wanna cut off, you can just nibble it off and you don't have to try to weasel a grinder in there or uh, anything like that. Also, as you're cutting all your pieces in your PVC, if you don't have a PVC cutter, I really recommend it. Um, for the first couple of years, I never used it. I'd always use my grinder. I'd use a hacksaw. And I just never wanted to spend the money until I stopped being cheap. And I spent, I think it's only like 10 bucks. But it makes things so much easier. You got a precise cut in two seconds. So definitely recommend investing a couple bucks in one of those. It's well worth it. So I would take a drill and I would drill where I wanted my rib cage or my ribs to go through the spine. Um, I do one at a time normally, bring it around, kind of get the shape you want, tape it. It's all really wonky at first. It's not this steady at first, you know, it, uh, it's going to want to flop around on you and kind of get the shape you want, tape it off, do all your ribs um, to the size that you want them to, however many ribs you want. Obviously, the anatomy of a pumpkin demon is really up for debate. If you want to give him three ribs, give him three. If you want to give him 20, give him 20. It's uh, totally up to you. But run the wire through, get your shape, tape it off all the way through, and then you run one wire coming up, like a, the sternum, and that is really what ties everything together then. Then everything stops being so floppy and you start feeling like you're not screwing it up. Um, you know, tape them around the back to kind of help keep their shape. Tape them on the sternum there. Um, then from there, once you're happy with the way the rib cage is set, you know, you can kind of go through, tweak and bend. I kind of like them to have a little bit of like a droop down and then come back up in the middle, but uh, you do you. This is all still the basic shape. When we start adding the tin foil, we're going to add all sorts of like thorny parts and stuff like that. So this is really just a skeleton here. Um, all the PVC, once you have your arms, your head, everything in the position that you want, I recommend putting 
self-tapping screws. These are just three quarter inch self-tapping screws. Um, anywhere you have a connection. I have them in the back. It doesn't matter if you can see them from the front or not, it's all gonna get covered up. But what this does is it keeps your fittings together. It keeps them from twisting. Um, you could do it with PVC glue, but with PVC glue, you get one shot at it. And as soon as you stick it together, that's where it's gonna be. If you wanna tweak it, you gotta cut that whole part out and splice in some new stuff. Um, it's just much easier to back out one of these self-tapping screws, give it a you know, quarter inch turn or whatever you want to get the shape just right, and then just drill that screw back in in a different area on that same fitting. Um, that seems to be really helpful. The hands are just more of that wire. Uh, I just cut individual links for the fingers, bent them, taped them on. They're all still kind of a little bit movable how they are now. Um, once we get the tin foil and the uh, latex and all that stuff over it, it will stiffen up. I haven't done the fingers on this hand yet, just because he's gonna be holding this pumpkin here and I haven't quite decided how I'm going to fill the bottom of this pumpkin, like the, I'm gonna make like a mounting board for the bottom here that will have it nice and secure here. And I have to run some wires because I'm gonna put an LED light inside of here and inside of, uh, inside of his head. So that's kind of where we're at now. The next step is gonna, ooh, the next step is going to be running wires for the lights. If you do wanna have the, his head light up, I recommend, before I ran wires all the way through the tubing and it was a huge pain. Um, if you just drill a hole right at the top of the tube here, and snake a wire straight down through and give yourself plenty. Let it hang right down out of your head so you're not trying to wire the light up inside the head. I made that mistake the first time. Um, give yourself plenty of wire hanging down so then that way you can make your splice down here and then tuck it all back up inside the head. Um, you want to do that now before you put the aluminum foil on. So if you drill in right from the top, have your wire come out and then you can just tape it to the PVC, come down, give yourself plenty of extra hanging down that you can put your little connector, uh, connectors or whatever down there. So I'll have two wires on this guy, one coming out of the top here and then one coming out of the hand here. They'll both come together. I'll splice them somewhere on the back and then just run a single wire down. So it's just one connection I have to make down there. But I think that is everything you need to know for the framework to get yourselves going with that. I um, think I covered everything. So the next step will be putting the aluminum foil on. So after re-watching what I just recorded, I realized that uh, you couldn't see much from being way back where you were. So I thought I would come up closer and show you what I was talking about. So you can see the ribs here. That's where the wire goes through. I just drilled straight through, slid the wire through, brought it around to the center, overlapped it however much I wanted to get the width that I wanted, and then taped it on both the overlapping ends. Did that three times here. I decided to put a collarbone on this guy where I did have the PVC coming across here. I didn't have that on the other ones. So I decided since I did have that, I just drilled a hole straight through and it just bends around in the back and I just taped the ends here. Um, then that sternum bone ties in at the top all the way down and I didn't actually run it into the PVC here. I just wrapped it around and taped it um, just so that way if there was a piece of rebar that was going to be going up inside this guy, the wire wouldn't interfere with it. Uh, these are the hands, nothing high tech about them, just more pieces of wire bent into place and taped to holy hell. Uh, and then, like I said, with the electrical wiring, I put a hole here and then ran the wire right out through here. So the pumpkin that he's holding, I'll figure out how I want to run that in. And then up on the head itself, drilled a hole in the top and ran the wire right through. 
So then that way it'll drop into the top of the jack-o'-lantern there. This is that fitting I was telling you about. It's got female thread on the neck and then that male thread screws right in and the one inch flare on it serves to hold the pumpkin up and in place. But yeah, I just figured I'd give you a closer look before we covered everything with the tin foil. Those are the self-tapping screws that I have everywhere holding all those fittings. Um, yeah, make sure you have a couple rolls of electrical tape. It is your friend at the early stage of building. All right, so we're cruising right along here. We have this guy almost all the way covered with aluminum foil. I'm just finishing up the last couple pieces here. I'm working off a roll that is 12 inches by 1,000 feet that I got from a restaurant supply place that's close to my house. That's a great place to pick up big rolls if you have one nearby. Um, out of this 1,000 foot roll, this is the sixth guy I'm doing, and there's probably at least a few more that are left in the roll there. So um, you can kind of gauge accordingly what you might need. I thought I was going to need way more for these guys than I actually did. Um, so my technique is I just pull off, you know, a couple foot piece, fold it in half, crumple it right around. And that's pretty much it. I might do that a couple of times, especially on the PVC parts. The wire um, doesn't take as much. You get more of a good crumpled look from the wire, but the PVC, where it's perfectly round, is harder to hide. So it takes a little bit more. You build up a little bit more in the joints, so that way it's not as perfect of a, uh, a 45 or a 90, whatever the fitting is that you use there. Um, same thing with the arms. You can definitely tell that that's a PVC pipe. So we'll add a couple more pieces on there and then uh, add a couple little thorns or twisted pieces running around just so it kind of hides the fact that it's a perfectly smooth or perfectly round piece of PVC. So I'm going to bring you in a little bit closer here and I'll show you some of the more detailed work. So one of the things I like to add is these little kind of thorny hooks. And you might say, well, pumpkin plants don't have thorns. And you'd be correct. But, fun fact, pumpkin demons do. It's science. Look it up. So, you can take, and I especially like to do it on the joint, just because it really kind of takes away from that angle. And just bend it around. Shape it with your hands. And just kind of get a shape you like. Sometimes they come out better than others. Sometimes I pull it off and I start over again. But by doing that, you kind of help take away from the perfect shape of the PVC. One of the other techniques that I like doing is getting a little bit of a longer piece folding it over on itself a couple of times, giving it a loose little twist, and kind of just wrapping it up the arm, and then squishing it down. And it just, it just helps to break up that perfectly smooth pipe that's there. And you just kind of keep playing with it until you get what you like, but you can already see that, that uh, Pipe is starting to be hidden a lot more than it was with that first coat I put on there. Uh, the other thing that I like to do is I add little reinforcing bars with this ceiling wire here in between the ribs. Any spot that there's going to be more flex than I want, all I do is I take a little measurement, cut the piece, give it a wrap with some electrical tape, then Slide it up inside and just tape it in there. And then we'll do the same thing at the top. Give the, give the wire a wrap just by itself so that way it has the wire really good. 
Get it up against your foil. And tape that into place. And what that's going to do is any of the parts that still have a little bit of floppiness to them, like, you know, your ribs, they're tied in at the sternum and at the spine, but out here on the edges, they're pretty loose. And by putting that wire in there, it just kind of stiffens the whole thing up and transfers any sort of shock it might get over to the other pieces. And it just kind of spreads it out a lot more. Afterwards, take a piece of foil and just cover it up. I find it's easier to do it after I have the whole thing foiled, adding these little pieces in. Otherwise, as you're trying to do the initial foil, you're fighting around them and it's kind of more of a pain in the butt to do it that way. I'll do that between each one of the ribs somewhere out on the edges here and if you did wire arms as opposed to PVC arms I recommend putting them on like the connecting point between the forearm and like the upper arm here um, otherwise those arms are going to want to sag on you a little bit um, same thing up on the shoulder if you're doing wire arms I recommend kind of keeping those elbows in tighter to the body because then you can tie the arm directly into the ribs and that's going to keep it much more uh, rigid for you. It's cool with the wire arms because like they have a little bit of play to them. So they have a little bit of movement in the wind and stuff, but you don't want them to be too floppy or, you know, somebody grabs it. You don't want the arm to, you know, to bend down on you. Um, the PVC arms, you don't have to worry about that as much. Obviously, it's all tied in with the, the pipe, um, but definitely add those supports in anywhere you think you might need it. I'm going to finish this up and I'll get back to you when it's time to start painting. All right, everyone, we're trucking right along. I'm joined this morning by the man himself, the assistant mayor of Halloween around these parts. Ethan, welcome to the workshop. Thanks. All right. What do you think of our guy so far? I like him. All right. So we got him all tinfoiled. He's ready for his next step. What do you think that next step is? Paint. It is paint, but not just any paint. It's a special blend, 50-50 of latex carpet adhesive and latex paint. Um, any latex paint will do, doesn't matter the finish, uh, just make sure it's latex. If you use an oil-based, it's not gonna be compatible with the latex carpet adhesive. I use whatever I have kicking around the shop or I shop the, the, uh, like the whoopsie paint section at Home Depot and Lowe's. It's a great place to score a gallon of ugly paint for like seven or eight bucks. Um, so add your paint into your bucket add your latex carpet adhesive in. I just give it like an eyeball. If it's 60-40, it's not gonna make a big difference. Aim for 50-50. I add the paint in. I take a scoop with this very precise cottage cheese container here and give it the Indiana Jones. Uh, add it in and I mix it up. When I mix it up, you're gonna notice that it's thicker than what, um, what paint normally would be because if you check out the consistency of this stuff, why don't you show them? The consistency of this stuff is much more like mayonnaise. So when you mix those two together, you're gonna to have a thicker blend than you want for coating this guy. But where they're both latex based, you can take it over to your sink, spin a little bit of water into it until it gets back to that paint consistency. Um, how much water you add is gonna depend on how big of a batch you're doing. It's not precise either. Just add a little bit at a time as you go until you're happy with the way the consistency looks. At that point there, you're gonna be ready to start painting. Um, use a cheap little like chip brush because you are going to destroy this brush and you're gonna be able to use it for multiple coats of this, but you're not gonna be able to use it for anything else afterwards. Afterwards, it's going to the trash. So don't use a good brush for this. I find a one inch is good for getting inside all the nooks and crannies when you're getting inside the ribs and all that. But I do have a special paint technique that I'm going to show you that would make any real painter cringe. Um, it's, uh, well, I'll show you. Do you think you're going to be able to, they're going to be able to see it from there? Yeah, bring it a little closer. All right, you heard the man. I'm going to bring you a little closer. I'm going to show you this special technique. All right, you got a front row seat now. So here is the special technique. 
We got our 50-50 blend here. This is normally the part where you would take and any respectable painter would knock some of that paint off your brush. Don't do that. Get that all covered, nice and heavy. Bring that right up and start slopping it on there. Right back in again and keep slopping it. Pretend like you're like a pit master slathering barbecue sauce on ribs. Just let it get in all those nooks and crannies. And while you're doing that, you're gonna notice a lot of that detail from the tin foil gets covered up. Don't worry too much about that. Do your whole prop with this super thick layer of paint. It's gonna be drippy, it's gonna be messy, don't wear good clothes. Do it in a workshop somewhere you don't care about the floor or spread a drop cloth down because this stuff will drip all over the floor. As you can see here from previous ones that I've done, after you've done the whole thing with this thick coat, you can come back, wipe your edge, get a dry brush, and then you can come back and start wiping the excess off. Wipe a little bit, clear it on the edge of the bucket, wipe a little bit, clean it on the edge of the bucket. Because of that latex carpet adhesive, you're gonna have a really long open time with this product. It's not gonna dry while you're painting the whole thing. This thing is gonna take a long time to cure. So you can put a heavy coat over everything and then come back and start working a dry brush over it. But by doing that heavy coat, it lets it seep down into all the nooks and crannies um, and just lets it really get down in there. If you try doing that with a regularly loaded paintbrush, it takes forever. So that's what I recommend. Go super heavy. Once the whole thing's done, come back with a drier brush and just keep kind of wiping until you're happy with the amount of detail you've exposed. Do a full coat. Let it dry for at least 24 hours. Come back in, do a second coat. When you do that second coat, if you add a little bit more paint to your mix, so it's a slightly different shade, that will help you tremendously when you're putting that second coat on, seeing what you've covered and what you haven't. So I'm gonna get to that point and then I'll bring you back in. All right, my boy here's got two coats on him and he's ready for finish paint. Before we start talking about that though, I want you to hear this. I don't know if you could hear that, but that's that carpet adhesive. He's got, uh, his second coat went on 48 hours ago. He's had a fan on him. Um, he's totally dry, but that carpet adhesive still has quite a bit of tackiness to it. And that's all gonna go away once you add your finished paint and your top coat. But that stickiness is what helps grab a hold of that tin foil so well. All the nooks and crannies gets, gets that, uh, that paint to hold as well as it does. And that's why I use that 50-50 blend. I don't think you would have near as much durability if you put paint directly to the tin foil. I think it'd be a nightmare and it wouldn't last long. That carpet adhesive, it gives it flex. It gives it the stick that it needs. Um, that's why I do the 50-50 blend. I take that extra step there. Um, so he's got his two coats on him. He's ready for finish paint. I'll tell you what I do for finish paint, but by no means is this meant to be a painting tutorial. If you're interested in something like that, I can't recommend strongly enough that you find somebody way more qualified than myself to talk to you about it because I just kind of make it up as I go. It's kind of a weakness of mine and I just kind of keep throwing paint at it and throwing paint at it until I'm finally happy or tired of painting and convince myself that I'm at a spot that I'm happy with. Um, so on the previous ones I did, they were pumpkin monsters. They were demons. Like I want them to be rotting and gross and nasty. So I started with a heavy coat of, not a heavy coat, but like a heavy dry brush of this kind of gross, brownish red that I have here. It's a porch and patio paint. It is latex. Um, started with that and did like a heavy dry brush. You were still able to see the dark, uh, 
you know, black and grays underneath in some areas. But that was the first heavy dry brush. And then I went back with a golden sunset, added some like mustardy yellow in there, um, and then finished off with like an ivy green. Um, so it just kind of looked like a decomposing, rotting uh, vine, you know, not, not healthy looking. And then I finished with a, don't mind this, this says matte. I finished the other ones with a gloss clear enamel just to protect the paint. It's not really for waterproofing or anything like that because this whole body, there's nothing that water is going to damage. The latex carpet adhesive, the tin foil, the wire, PVC, water is not going to damage this guy like paper mache or anything like that. You don't have to worry too much. This is just to put a layer of protection over the paint uh, so you don't have to worry about it in the weather. If you use a mat, you won't get a shiny look. So if you're looking for like a nice healthy looking vine, um, I would recommend using a mat. I'll probably use a mat on this guy. I'm gonna test a couple areas, see what I like, but I'll probably go with a mat on him where he is for somebody else. And I don't want him to be too gross and gnarly looking. Um, but if you want that slimy look, hit it with a gloss and it will look you know, like wet and slimy. Uh, so that's what I do on the body. The heads I do a little bit differently. Um, you might have noticed before when I had the pumpkins up that there were faces on the back of them. It's because these are repurposed pumpkins. These were jack-o'-lanterns that I got that had like traditional jack-o'-lantern faces on them, but I didn't want to use the jack-o'-lantern faces, so I covered them up. You might be able to see the outline in the back there of the old face. What I did is I put a layer of the 50-50 blend over this, um, and then just took a blue shop towel, painted one side of it, covered the face, and then uh, painted again a 50-50 blend over that. And that just kind of seals that face out. If I wanted to go crazy with it, I could put a couple more layers and the you know very faint outline would disappear. But it's the back of the head, it's gonna be tucked in, and it's gonna be back here. I'm not overly concerned with it. So. That's what I did there to cover up the old faces. If you have new pumpkins, obviously you don't have to worry about that. Uh, on the head itself, I am going to add a little bit of paper clay to just detail some eyebrows up in here. Uh, on the other ones I did that I'll show you in just a minute, um, I really built out the eyes, I built out the mouth, the teeth, because I want them to be really nasty looking. Um, this guy obviously has got like a Jack Skellington kind of creepy, but still friendly face. Um, so I don't want to get too monstrous with them. So I'm thinking I might just play around with the eyebrows with a little paper clay, do that and call that good. Once the paper clay is dry, I'm going to hit it again with that 50-50 mix as the first layer of protection, sealing the paper clay in. Once that's dry, then I'll go to my finish paint. Um, obviously I'm going to have him looking more like a fresher pumpkin. So it'll be oranges and browns, darkening the uh, the vertical lines that come down. Um, and just kind of playing with that until I get that to a place that I'm happy with. And when I'm happy with the paint, I will then, instead of using the clear coat, uh, I find that a spar varnish offers a little bit more protection, which is what I want over the paper clay. You might be able to get away with doing the spray enamel, but I felt much better brushing on a coat of the spar varnish uh, and real heavy in the areas that I had any of the paper clay. That was like my second line of defense against the elements. Did a heavy coat, well, I'll do a heavy coat of that over the whole head, and then I'll dust a couple more layers uh, once it dries with just a spray, just to give it a little bit more protection, seal it all up. Um, but yeah, so those are the steps that I'm going to do. I'm not going to bring you back in in between every single step. I'm going to do all that stuff and he'll pretty much be a finished product at that point when I bring you back and I'll show you how he came out and then I'll show you the other guys. All right, boys and girls, we're finally here. Finished product. This video took longer than I thought it was going to. I definitely missed my 10 minute mark I was shooting for. Don't know what I was thinking there, but here he is, finished product. You might notice we upgraded his overalls when I put my daughter's little black overalls back on him after I got them all painted. 
he looked absolutely ridiculous. So he needed an upgrade to an old pair of my car hearts. The, uh, the painting process was exactly like I described in the last clip. The only thing I didn't mention was I like to add some burlap in after I do the initial base color, um, which in this case was green. I mix some of that green with the carpet adhesive and then painted both sides of the burlap and just wrapped it around in various places. Gives them a little bit more of like an organic look and breaks up some of those clean lines. I added a little bit of paper clay, not nearly as much as I have on the ones that I built previously, but just built up his eyebrows a little bit, but I didn't want to mess with the way his, uh, his mouth and his eyes came out. I kind of just liked the way he was looking, so I wasn't going to mess with it too much, but in just a second, when you see the other photos that I have of uh, the ones that I've done, you'll see what adding more of that paper clay and making more pronounced features can really do for, uh, for a jack-o'-lantern. Other than that, oh, the lights. I have one LED eagle eye light in both of those pumpkins. Um, they're super cool. They're waterproof. They're meant for ground effects for uh, motorcycles, cars, stuff like that. Uh, they run off the 12 volt power supply. They're super cool. If you're interested in hearing more about them, I have another video on how to make your own homemade spotlights using these lights. They come in a variety of colors. They're nice and bright, they're dimmable, um, and they're cheap. That's like 12 bucks for like a 10 pack of them. So it's, it's totally worth it. Uh, but you can find that on my page, how to make your own spotlights so we don't get into the wiring and all that stuff here. But other than that, this is the finished product. I'm gonna end this video with a couple of close-up shots of him, and then I'll show you the rest of the, uh, the gang that I have built. They look a lot different, but the process is exactly the same. It's just a difference of what color paint you put on and how you build up those facial features. But you can really take this ball and run with it any way you see fit. So hopefully you learned something and it wasn't a waste of your time. And uh, happy building, happy Halloween season.